so that's that's a good option so if you can figure out bitcoin of nuclear given look at the deals of nuclear look at how it's structured and if you can make that work with a bitcoin community you can maybe start and saying we could have a nuclear power station for a bitcoin community just through the mines and the things and that's going to pay for it and maybe you know with that you can find a performant asset Hugo Kruger, welcome to the show. How are you doing? Fine, thanks. And yourself, Kevin, I'm doing well. Just doing great. Wonderful Sunday. The sun is shining. Yeah. It's beautiful. I mean, you got this view great. over the mountains. Wonderful Sunday. Yes. Shine. All right. Uh, I turned off the two YouTube, so I don't have an echo. Um, all right. So, Hugo, um, now we were planning to do... Uh, a live chat together with Matthew Eret and mm. uh, in event two with Cynthia Chunk, his wife. Uh, now, because of the uh, actual, you know, the current things going on in Russia, I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Like, uh, what is your theory? What, <laughs> what's your, what do you, I mean, what do you think about this whole situation? Uh, is this like a huge psyop or? Uh, um was I, i've been nearing that I, I i have no idea man because i i so i've stopped following like most people i think we're tired of that war um i was on a show the other day and i, I just say what i've been saying since the beginning which is that war would not have happened had we implemented the minstu protocol the one that existing peace treaty everyone knows that so it was provoked it's not unprovoked litigation nonsense there was major provocations there was uh, funding of death squads in ukraine by the cia People being burned alive in, uh, I think, what they said was in 2017, if my memory now serves. There's lots of bad stuff happening. They wanted the Russians to invade. Russia invades, and now everyone throws up their hands and say, ah, Putin is Hitler, you know. Um, that's basically what's happening. So, you know, war has now gone on, and the only way to end it, um, so South Africa's president was there yesterday, the day before, with the African um, Russian summit. And the African leaders are saying the right thing, in my view, which is uh, end the war. Whatever you can, stop the fighting, stop killing people, because there's young men being died there, that's senseless. No war has ever, you know, ever makes sense. But it won't happen if, unless the United States joins the peace process. That's my view of it. So now to your more recent question, what's happening with Wagner and, and <laughs> Putin and um, who's this guy? Lukashenko is mediating between Wagner and Putin. I mean, this whole thing doesn't add up to me. Yeah, that's Extremely. Now, now, uh, what I what I didn't know, I mean, because I just read an article that I didn't know a little bit of the history of um, also about um, uh, Putin's father uh, was the cook of of Lenin. Oh, really? I, I don't yeah. know. I know he wasn't in. I'm not sure if that's true. I I know that he was in a Crimea or something. Yeah, and the some funny thing is uh, on top of that is that uh, what what's his name? Prush, Prush, how do you pronounce his name? I, I can't pronounce. Yeah, that guy. The guy, yeah, who who was sort of uh, now kicked out or I don't know. Maybe it, I think it's a whole theater because I think they're best buddy these these two because he's he's or used to be the cook and best friend of of Putin. So I'm really. I don't know. There's a lot of credible stories from you know other experts, uh, and uh, I, I, I've asked friends in Russia what's going they on. Just cashed it in, you know. Maybe you know this accounting error by Pentagon, and uh, maybe it wasn't like six billion, but at least you know a, a billion or two. Maybe they cashed it in, you know, played four D chess, uh, and then you know played along, and you know, but who knows. We'll, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens. I mean, but so I, when I speak to people in Russia, they say they don't think it's a coup. We don't know. It's just a it's it's a staged event, and they basically maybe trying to launch another offensive because of this thing. I guess we'll find out in a week's time what's happening. I I, I just sort of like I hear all these theories, and I I don't know what to believe anymore. It just sounds weird. That's all I'm saying because Wagner, as far as I know, was defeating uh, some of the Ukrainian armies at at Bakhmut or something. They killed other men. And now all of a sudden this guy wants to take over. Um, there's also a story related to Africa where apparently Wagner's got lots of soldier states all over the Sahel. Mm -hmm. And they're involved in um, coups and things over there. So, you know... A, a, because they're mercenaries, right? I mean, they're a bunch of mercenaries. Basically, but it seems that like, like almost a country on their own, they, uh, they, they're sort of like an arm of the Russian army. Mm -hmm. Also, the United States has mercenaries and, and, and these complicated things all over Africa. And it seems that they're just playing geopolitics in, in other countries now. And it's, it's weird. Um, but I, I have no 
I have no idea what to make of this whole thing, other than it's it's, it's so strange, you know. Okay. All right. So let's continue our conversation from last time. I thought we could cover maybe or talk about some topics or subtopics we we, we wanted to cover. I wanted to cover. Um, so you know, I mean, it's always good, you know, to talk about Russia and China because it always ties in into Iran somehow geopolitically, macroeconomically, strategically, and technologically. Um, so first of all, yeah, um, I just wanted to point out um, uh, Matthew Arrett and his wife, Cynthia Chong, uh, uh, wrote, uh, I think, a, a few few articles, but two of them I just like to point out um, it's uh the one is one of them is called um let me see what is it called iran century and a half fight for sovereignty by matthew Interesting. yeah it was published in june 13th 2023 and the other one is by since by his wife cynthia chung the sword of Damocles of western europe it's a part one and two, uh, part, a three-part series introduction to the Shah of Shah's Kingdom of Kings. So, yeah, I just wanted to, I'm going to put them, put them in the show notes, but I thought to understand a little bit about the history, the background, and the mm. involvement of the CIA, MI6, and even Mossad, um, because I, uh, you know, I mean, fact is that the SAVAK, the sec uh, former secret police under Shah, had been trained, uh, uh, you know, by CIA and... Yeah. MI6 and Mossad and one of and, the most cruel, one of a very cruel uh, secret police uh, force. So yeah, Strong. yeah. Look, it was basically Gestapo for lack of a better word. Exactly. Um, yeah. And uh, this is not just in Iran; they use it in Latin America as well. They train secret police there to oppress the population. Ecuador is a good example. El Salvador is another example. Um, you know, this is how the U.S. Uh, has always supported fascism. Um, it's a point that Noam Chomsky made so many times ago, uh, when it suits the geopolitical strategy. So, um, you know, the history of Iran is, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's a rather tragic history because, you know, they had the Great Persian Empire years ago. And the last century has been a century of humiliation. So the way I understand it is they were first humiliated by Russia in the beginning of the last century, and then afterwards by Great Britain. And then even the Iranians at the time, the, uh, I think it was the Qajar elites, they thought that maybe it's um, good to invite America as a counterbalance to Great Britain when Britain ruled the oceans and the world. So then, you know, America became dominant. America started uh, wanting the oil. They invaded Iran with the Soviet Union after the, Britain and America after the Second World War, but America... You know, eventually tried to develop the oil fields when oil became valuable. This, this long history of that thing, and they were always intervening in the internal affairs of Iran. Now, given the historical depth of Iranian society, uh, they didn't like this. They don't like being bossed around. They don't like it when somebody else is, is training a secret police that's oppressing you. And it's not difficult to see how, from this point of perspective, uh, Ayatollah Khomeini came to power. What everyone thinks of the guy, we can understand why the Iranians supported him. And this is something the Americans has never come to terms with because they always think that they can win back Iran. As if, you know, even if Iran opens up in trades today and thinks it's going to become a pro-American country. Nonsense. With that long history of intervention, whatever government remains in Iran, democratic or not, will be very skeptical of the foreign intervention of the United States. The same issue in South Africa, by the way. We have a democratic government, but they do not play along with the Western world because they understand the geopolitical games that's being played with them. Mm. Now you are married to an Iranian, and as you know, as we talked before, um, I mean, I'm was born in Iran and raised until seven years of age in in Shiraz in Iran, and then uh, my 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 dad, my father, took me then to Austria. He had been in Austria in the late fifties and early sixties, studied medicine, but half like medicine, and but then he had to go. But then he went back, you know, worked for several foreign like national corporate uh, international corporations, uh, also Austrian, U.S. James Scott and Siemens and um, sort of, I think, technical advisor or something. Anyway, so um, uh, the thing what what always, you know, when I uh, contemplate or when I talk with other, uh, uh, you know, exiled or, or you know, uh, people who escaped from either before or during the revolution, 1979, is that um, because when, the, when was the first time you were in Iran, uh, Hugo? I would say two years ago, the first time, really. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, because yeah. I was there until 1979, and I do somehow impartially, vividly remember what it was like, you know, the whole mindset, the mentality, the culture. It was like super modernized, you know, super westernized. 
pretty, I would say, open and free society, right? So this is what a lot of people, you know, confirm with me. It's like, it's a little bit shocking. A lot of people, I mean, I hadn't been back to Iran since 1979 or yeah. 1980, actually, because I went there once to visit my mom because my, my parents had been divorced. And um, so the thing is, is like, it's a little bit shocking because uh, if it wasn't like for this uh, Iranian, uh, you know, uh, Islamic, theo what do you call it, theocratic, uh, whatever Islamic regime, I think we would we would um, we would have a different, you know, meant uh, still have you know this this open um, open minded and and um, yeah, I, I I agree. Look, the the, the 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 problem is that the Iranians during the revolution, the, the, they they were right to demand independence. Let's speak on that. They even have some aspect of democracy today, I would even argue, but they have this weird religious fanaticism that's always overshadowing the society, this valayati faqi type of nonsense, right? And that is the thing that, that needs to be worked against. Um, but um, so, you know, there is a dark element to it. I mean, look at the, the women's right protests, look at the amount of executions every year, look at all these things. Nobody wants to live in a society like that. But I, I do still think that there is an Iranian identity, and this goes mostly in a conversation, that is still very strong. There's still a lot of people who love the country, even those who've left. You know, um, they still look back and they say they want to go back home. So, um, you know, but, I, yeah, but, I, but, but they do say, you know, people have changed. You know, it's like uh, the whole atmosphere has changed. And, you know, when you, when you remember the old times in Iran, uh, you know, up to the whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But 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 I think you mu you must be very careful here. Um, if I look at statistics about Iran, in the when this revolution occurred, only something like thirty percent of Iranians could read and write. So those who remember the good times back then, okay, yeah, they were, li they, they were living in isolation from their own society. That's my view. Okay, I know some people disagree with that, and it was not that great for everyone. So if I look at the level of development that's taken place, I've traveled all over the country now, two twice. Okay. I give that government credit to achieve under sanctions what other governments around the world could not do, which is allowing to feed their own populations. They've done that. That is the Islamic government. That is difficult for many Iranians in exile to accept because it means you need to accept that even that government, as evil as it is and as bad as it is, and, and all these things that we read about in the media, has some form of legitimacy in the eyes of the population. Mm -hmm. And that is where I think I, I find the Iranian diaspora is in a very difficult situation because they love their country. They want to see a change. They don't know what to do. Okay. And they, they, they look back and they say, we want to have an open society. We want a democracy, all those great things. But because of that, they become very susceptible, in my view, to propaganda from the Western world, which is to radicalize them against the entire society. And to have hatred for the people back there. And when I go and I speak to the people who live there on everyday life, they sometimes feel this way. They sometimes feel like the Iranians we see on our and Western media, right, do not speak for them anymore. That there's a disconnect between the two populations. And you two need to reconnect on some level. And it's easy, you speak the same language. You still speak the language and the culture. And it's only through that way that you'll change society. My view has always been Iran has to change slowly, okay, and it has to change democratically. And it can do so. It's not that difficult given its constitution. The Iranian constitution, the Valayati Fakhi, allows for referendums on important questions. And one important question is the role of Islam in society. It's a question of electorate. It's a question of separations of power, all these things. So the pathway for democratic change is there, but it needs to be used by the people. I'm very skeptical against anyone that wants a revolutionary change. Because look at what happened last time. You know, last time it was a disaster. So that's sort of my position on it. You know, I say it's an outside observer, you know, semi-outside, my wife's as well. Because I understand, you know, I understand the Iranians in my, uh, uh, that I meet. Last night we had a guest from Iran as well. He feels the exact same way as you do. I, I completely understand. I have empathy for their position. But I want them to understand the greater geopolitical context before they try and propose solutions for their country. And sometimes that message is not being communicated. Yeah, yeah, no, I get you what you're saying. Um... Now the thing is, um, okay, with all the sanctions, with all the embargoes, I mean the the population. Uh, now you know you you probably have heard this. This uh, there's a there's a saying. I don't know. A lot of Iranians said, "Oh, you know, during Shah time, one person within the family, you know, uh, <laughs> was able to work and you know could feed ten other people, and now ten people you know work to to feed one person." So uh, would you? I, 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 would you I'm not sure that? that's true. No, I think that's just not. 
And mm-hmm. I think that's part of it. It might have been true if you were a little bit in the cities and better off. I'm not sure. The average woman in 1979 Iran had six children. Today, it's less than one. Okay. The status of women has improved under the current government. Mm-hmm. Okay. At least from an economic perspective. Iran trains today more engineers than the United States of America. Okay. 60% of them are women. Okay, so that needs to be acknowledged somewhere along the line of the message to get an accurate picture of what's going on. It is not true that the lives of ordinary Iranians haven't improved in the society. I'm sorry, but that's just false. If I look at it through social economic measures, World Bank data, doesn't matter how you do the analysis, you find that the Iranian government is, I, I argue, they are more nationalist than they are religious. And that's an important distinction to make. But yes, I agree, there's nationalist fanaticism, there's religious fanaticism, and those are the elements you want to weigh, the hard, very hardcore Iranians. You want to try and neutralize them so the democratic guys can make their argument. But by, you know, making statements like that, which is just false, it's not helping anyone, you know. Yeah, okay. No, no, I, I would just, um, yeah, I, I I know that, and um, and I know that a lot of the um, conditions have improved, actually, because you talked about the literacy or illiteracy, you talked about the, um, and I, I do think that, uh, let's say, women's rights, yeah, a lot of things have changed and improved, actually, within the last, whatever, four decades or something. Yeah. Um, now, maybe we can make a segue into, um, now the Iranian population the iranian government or iranian nation nation state has had some time to to you know to do their own thing uh especially yeah. technologically uh structurally i think a lot of even hygi- maybe even hygienics or the 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 um you know the the way cities look like and and a lot of things have, have definitely improved um mm. but I mean, is there anything that has deteriorated? Well, it, I mean, the, the the right of freedom of expression has varied throughout the country, even under this government. Because remember, they have different factions within Iran. Mm-hmm. Okay, so there was a time under uh, Katami, for example, when it was more open than it is today, and it was under Ahmadinejad, for example. Okay, the current government in Iran is very hard-lined. So when you have that, you have a security force that responds. And my biggest worry in Iran is that the role of the revolutionary guard in everyday life and all institutions is so deeply entrenched. Yeah. So you have a, a quasi Gestapo ruling the country and getting that out. So those institutions can be under democratic rule is very difficult. That is one of the things that is the, the most dangerous. And that's why I think it's very dangerous for any country like America to instigate another coup d'etat. Because if you're going to try it, the security force is going to kill their own people because security people don't talk. They don't listen. They just kill because they care about safety. You know, so those conditions are very hard. Then also for women with a job, for example, during the, the time of the Shah, they had a choice. They don't have a choice at the moment. So even though women's economic position has improved, their status and their social condition in many ways have deteriorated. You know, so you need to really identify what issue you're talking about. That's just the point I'm trying to make. You know, everything is a trade-off. Uh, there are things that were way worse during the Shah's time. And I don't think people need to celebrate that time. I also don't think a, a king is a is a good way to rule any country. You know, mm. um, it, it, the, the Iranians are far more intelligent and democratic, anyways. But when I speak to ordinary Iranians, they express their opinion actually on the streets. The government, though, shuts down the internet for protests and they kill people if the riots get too big. They kill children, you know, which is unacceptable in the world. They do all those things, and those are the things that need to change um, and that people need to find to change. The way. I propose we do it as outsiders is we stay out of their affairs and we allow the atmosphere for them to do so. And that's why I'm not in favor of sanctions. I think sanctions are, you see, because here's the problem. All these evil things we talk about become intensified when you put the government under pressure and we're sanctioning them, we're punishing them, we're doing this, we're doing that, that's making it worse. And that's what I, I support, you know, the, the reform-minded people in Iran who said, you guys are nuts for what you're doing, you don't understand. Yeah. And Iran, I mean, would have been one of the last uh, domino, you know, uh, one of the last dom- dominoes to fall, uh, according, you know, as you probably know, this this talk by the general who who said, you know, yeah. he was even shocked by the U.S. general, whatever, you know, said, clock. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. So 
whatever after. Uh, yeah, look, there was clear intention by George Bush to invade Iran. It was openly stated between George Bush and T Tony Blair that an email exchange, and then General Wesley Clark confirmed it, and then the evidence was overwhelming. But it's thanks to the Iraqis, okay, that Iraq the Iraqis resisted the American rule. They negotiate the Americans out of Iraq, even though America still has troops there. The Americans could not have a halt because of their own insurgencies. They blamed Iran for funding those insurgents. I don't believe that's even true, because some were not. It's local people in Iran that said, uh, in Iraq had said enough. And it's thanks to the courage of the Iraqis that Iran was not invaded. Because the, the saying was the road through ba to Tehran goes through Baghdad. Mm -hmm. And the Americans have been negotiated out of the Middle East thanks to the local populations. They have just said, we had enough. We don't want to, we're not a colony. That's basically what they're saying. We are our own independent people. Yeah. And Iran, as you know, as you know I mean, has uh, unimaginably, you know, done a, a huge, I mean, thanks to the, you know, Iranian population, the Iranian scientists, technologists, you know, the younger people, because I think, I mean, whatever one thinks and I think about this this tyrannical <laughs> Iranian regime is that still, I mean, they have this wisdom, obviously, they have had this wisdom to say, you know what, uh, just uh, think out of outside the box. Maybe it's time, as you know, as I said last mm -hmm. time, not to copy others, but maybe let others copy us by, by you know, opening up technologies and, and yeah. uh, be more creative uh, on every level, whether it be nuclear, plasma technology, defense technologies, conventional defense technologies, uh, what have you. So if they, uh, uh, the Anglo-American, whatever uh, military industrial complex, if, I mean, if they had the chance that would have been like 30, 40 years ago, they should have like attacked, invaded Iran a very long time ago. But now it's impossible in my, from my point of view. What do you yeah. think? Well, it's 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 very costly if they do it. You see, because Iran, if you go to Bushehr, for example, the Iran's got its military arsenal facing the Saudi Arabian oil fields. So what is it saying? If you invade us, we blow the hell out of your oil fields. They send missiles and rockets into there and they'll destroy the whole thing. So that it takes the world economy with them. So they have looked, they, they have to fortify their defenses. It's also a very mountainous area. Remember, you've got the Zahros and the Abros Mountains. Um, it's the walls of Iran. No army can go over those things. So the Iranian soldiers are stationed there. If you go to uh, Azerbaijan, where I was uh, two years ago, on the border between Azerbaijan and Iran, it's a military base over there. Mm -hmm. So they've stationed the military for the defense of their country. All Iranian men serve in the army. The army is served in local communities where they have local intelligence. It's like the Swiss army. They've structured it that way. So they know how to defend their own country. Okay, And why? Because they have, they have reason to believe that they would be invaded. So um, my view of Iran is, I mean, you speak of technology, they've got good engineers and they've got good technology. Yeah. And of all the developing countries, South Africa, Brazil, Russia, uh, uh, India, and Iran, Iran has got, is one of, the only country with an educated youth that's highly skilled. Yeah. Okay? Iran publishes more PhDs a year than Russia at this stage. Mm. Um, so if they open up to the world, they come and draw investment. It's the ideal place for investment. Right? They've got all the high-level skills for the high-level economy and to, to become an Asian tiger like the, the, the Japanese were. And they're already thinking of this, the leadership. So my view is open up the economy to become an extraordinary a strong country. It's not even a threat to America. That's the joke of it. Because the states in America will benefit the most from imports from Iran will be Republican states. So all the incentives are there to stop our nonsense with Iran. Mm -hmm. But we are, I don't know, we, we're still stuck in the mindset as if it's the 1979 revolution. And that's thats something I'm trying, it's its trying to open up that conversation is very difficult. Yeah. Uh, you probably know under the reign of the Shah, uh, the, I don't know, the United States or the Anglo-American uh, imperials, I mean, they wanted, I think they had the plan to make Iran sort of the nuclear center, uh, not only you know, nuclear energy, but nuclear weapon. Uh, I mean, I think... Yeah, if you go to Isfahan, it's all in the mountain where there's, similar to, there's uh, a nuclear um, program that the Americans gave. MIT at the time thought nuclear power is too expensive in America, they'll put it in Iran under the Shah. Mm -hmm. So the, the Americans don't care about nuclear weapons. They've never cared about it, right? The reason they care about the, Iran's nuclear program is because of its independence. It's got nothing to do with it. America's given nuclear weapons to Pakistan, new Muslim country. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. it's they don't concern themselves about it. Yeah. Maybe we should get this question out of the way. I mean, there is no way Iran is into it. You know, whatever you, we think about this Iranian regime, but they don't. Maybe it's not even necessary to develop. I mean, just 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 out of. Uh, 
uh, logical conclusion or, or analysis, it's it's it would be insane, you know, to develop uh, nuclear or, yeah. or build nuclear weapons, and maybe they don't need it. Maybe they have no. They 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 like stated the very clear carefully. It's it's been stated by uh, Khamenei. Uh, let me read you the quote that Khamenei said because people don't read. You know, this is something that I. Uh, Give me one second. Let me show, show it. So this is a quote that was given by Khamenei in 2012. Okay, he said, "Nuclear weapons neither ensure security nor do they consolidate political power. Rather, they are a threat to both security and political power." The events that took place in the 1990s showed that the possession of such, such weapons could not even safeguard a regime like the former Soviet Union. And today, we see certain countries which are exposed to waves of these insec insecurity despite possessing a atomic bombs. That is Ayatollah Said Ayi Khamenei in 2012. It's a fatwa that he gave against nuclear weapons. Iran has, does not have a nuclear weapons program. They have a capability program. They keep the centrifuges. They tell the Americans we are able to make a weapon and look at how they negotiate. They spin centrifuges, they spin it down. They said we will bring it down if you give us concessions. That is their grand strategy. And the U.S. has never understood it. So they're going to 60% now. Why 60%? Because you use it for submarines. They're making you your submarines. But they're not going to 90% enrichment. Now they say, okay, we can bring it down to 20, 30%. Why? Because that's all you need to, to, to run a reactor. You know, so they, they figured out how to play on the psychology of the Americans and Israel. And the other argument here that comes in is Israel. Netanyahu now is facing prison sentences. What is not being said the reason he's facing prison sentences is he's involved with a nuclear smuggling mafia, okay, okay. uranium smuggling mafia. The International Atomic Energy Agency is waiting for him, okay, and he's trying to scare about the threat of Iran to evade prison sentences. Oh. And Israel has always had this tactic when there's internal conflict in Israel, they try and amplify threats outside of the country. Yeah. So this and is Israel is still the, the is it the only country right now that has not never you know always ref, has always refused to sign the what do you call non proliferation treaty? Well, in, India has also not signed it, uh -huh. um, but India India is a much more powerful country. Um, Israel has uh, has a policy of nuclear ambiguity. It's complete farce. So we all know Israel's nuclear weapons. They probably have seventy of them. Um, Netanyahu, so Israel's never acknowledged or said or not said. It's a deception tactic of nuclear weapons. Um, we know that the Americans tried giving them, but what isn't said, the way they got it is through mug, uh, mafia smuggling. And there's a very good argument. You see, here's the problem. Iran has proposed for the Middle East a nuclear peace a free uh, a weapon zone. If that zone comes into effect, Israel is forced to sign a non-proliferation treaty. If the non-proliferation, Israel is found to violate the non-proliferation treaty, what does that mean? Under existing US law, all aid to Israel must be suspended immediately because you're not allowed to give it to a country that violates the NPT. That's US oh, law. Oh, that's a leverage. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. You see you see the problem here. Yeah? So that yeah. means the Palestinian question will have to come into answer first because you cannot, uh, the international law will force you to solve your internal conflicts. So th that's why there's such a, th this is the greater politics that's being played here. I just quickly want to get my charger. If you give me like one, uh, two minutes. Okay, I'm coming now. No, well, Hugo is gone again. Uh, I would definitely advise you or recommend the articles by Cynthia Chung and Matthew Arrett. Uh, Cynthia Chung is Matthew Arrett's wife, so but they're both, you know, uh, brilliant investigative researchers, uh, journalists, uh, written a um, bunch of books. Um, but yeah, these. All two. right, that's great. Yeah, uh, I'm back. Yeah. All right, we're back. So let's go back to yeah um, to Iran and who do you think I mean is um, because there's some things you know I cannot verify I mean who are these ayatollahs or um, mullahs <laughs> uh, uh, in Iran are they what what's the what's their agenda I mean is there because Iran is one of the few countries that have, where the central, the so-called, you know, the, 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 you know, the central banking system hasn't been established. You know, uh, they 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 still have some sort of independence, monetarily, financially. Yeah, they still they still have their own development bank, but they also have their own central bank, and they also have their own economists and things. 
Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I, I don't know much about the central bank thing. I, I always don't know what to make of it. It's true that they haven't been integrated into SWIFT and the international transactions, but they're now signing a deal with, with Russia mm-hmm. where they're doing currency swaps. And I think they're going to have something similar with China as well. Um, but I have also seen that apparently Chinese trade with Iran is not as high as some people have said it is. So um, I, I don't know what to make of this thing. Um, they have their own bank, they have their own politics, they have their own uh, dominant class. Uh, what the mullahs think and do, some people think they are stupid, other people think they are rational. I, I don't think they're completely irrational people. They just make decisions and they're a little bit influenced by religious thinking. It's not different than many American leaders. Um, but um, I think that the real power play in Iran is something between the religious people and the revolutionary god. And it's a question of who makes what decision there. And I think the, the, the influence of the intelligence agency is incredibly strong in the country. Okay, you mean by intelligence agency, the Iranian are... are... Well, the, the IRCG, and I know they've got local intelligence as well. So they've got two groups, as I understand it. And I, I think um, in any country, uh, I mean, like the KGB in Russia, or the FSB in Russia, uh, they play a very strong, you know, they play what they call a shadow over power. They feed information to the leaders. Mm-hmm. Okay, and it depends what they feed, the leaders will react on it. And they know how to feed information so people will react in a certain way. So this is the same with the CIA in America. It's it's undoubtable that's the most powerful institution in the United States. You know, so um, that that's how I see it. It's those who, who control the information, control the power. Um, because, I mean, SEPA, they call SEPA, you know, the in, in Iran. They all have their own bank in Iran, their own development bank. They put into industries. Okay, so this is the type of thing that is happening there. But I know they've got banks that have totally detached themselves from that institution as well. So they've got different competing banks. And I find the banking system very interesting. The Iranians have so many bank accounts from different banks. It's a, it's a very strange system. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that's what I know about it. How do you see, I mean, because um, talk, we talked about like the youth uh, because uh, seven, I think seven to eighty percent of of the Iranian population is around, like pretty young, like around maybe thirty, around the age of thirty or younger. Yeah. Um, and I mean, they're desperate. I think a, a substantial number. I mean, massive, massive. I mean, what is it? What's the population uh, in Iran? Seventy, eighty uh, million. Yes, yeah, eighty, eighty million. So I know. Okay. How would you? I mean, what what do you see? Do you, do you see in the foreseeable future, in the next five to ten years, that the conditions? You know that the suffering. Uh, <laughs> well, well, look, uh, many m- many of them have studied overseas, have brought ideas from the West back home. Okay, many of them have um, are more open minded. They're not so de- attached to the fo- previous revolution and the Iran Iraq war. You should never f- influ- uh, forget the influence of that war on Iranian psychology. Um, many of them still are so so about the government. Some support, some don't. But slowly but surely, they are moving through the ranks of power. Okay, And that is the best thing that can happen, is that the old die and the young come in. And I think over time, um, they will bring the change with them. I'm more optimistic about that because uh, they called it the baby boomerang in Iran. They, they had so many children after the Iran-Iraq war. And those children are now coming to age. They've had more experience in life at the moment. And they are slowly moving into the ranks of power. And I think um, it w- if they take over and they've got the right policies and mindset, it will be a, a very much a nice country. But what worries me deeply about Iran is actually that there's a lot of young men who feel that they don't have any hope. Um, they are in their 20s and their 30s. They might not be the most educated sometimes. They're still good with their hands type of people. And they feel that life is really stepping on them. They feel miserable. And that is because of a lack of development. I link that if I look at these figures, I think it has to do with the electricity crisis. Iran has got the same electricity per person as South Africa, which is very low. And they need more energy and they need more electricity to develop the country. They're also running out of water. So all of these are infrastructure developmental issues that Iran is facing. And they need to start addressing it because their population has grown faster than they've planned for it. That's surprising because I thought electricity, I mean, they have like, they're so advanced with the te- nu- nuclear technology, nuclear energy technology. Yeah. I thought it's like abundance of, of energy. Uh, They've got no lack of resources. It's just a question of implementing policy. They were late. The, the, the government waited about it. And remember, your infrastructure projects last only 50 to 60 years. Then you have to rebuild them. 
Mm-hmm. That's actually the case in Europe at the moment. That's why everyone's talking about infrastructure now. I don't know if you've noticed in America as well, the stuff was built in New Deal. They're coming, the, the wheels are falling off the bus and we need to rebuild it. And the only way to do that is to mobilize state spending. Okay, so that my view is for infrastructure. I don't believe private infrastructure can work. Um, I know some people disagree on that. And uh, South Africa is having this debate at the moment because ours was built in the apartheid here. Uh, Europe is having this debate of look at the wind farms exploding in Germany. You've seen these things. yeah. Uh, the, the reason for this is a crony capitalists are looking for a way to cash in on the infrastructure running out. Mm-hmm. And what they haven't figured out yet is to escape the laws of entropy, which is all things that turn come to an end. All things will come to an end. And the rich of this is why I think these Davos guys are so in panic because the population is going to say, if we have to rebuild the infrastructure, we're not going to pay for it. You're going to pay for it. Mm. Right. And that is what they're worried about. And I think that is a, that's a lesson they're on as well. So the, the, the rich has been avoiding the question of infrastructure. They need energy for the new industry at the moment. Uh, they need investment. They need some of their own money. I don't know how they're going to get it. And my view, that is a solution to get all these men that are sitting on the streets um, to try and mobilize them for work a little bit. And, you know, people say when I say that I sound like a dictator, but uh, I don't see another solution. Mm-hmm. Now, the thing is, I mean, I'm not a, you know, I mean, I knew Matthew Arad loves to talk about, and he's a, you know, super expert and specialist on unipolar, multipolar world. And, you know, and now we have this Belt Road Initiative with bricks and, you know, all this infrastructure, because I mean, the Chinese, you know, instead of going to war and imperialistic, you know, a build up, but they, they do build, they do invest uh, more rationally, you know, but so do you, I mean, uh, under these conditions, I mean, do you see like in a foreseeable future with China, Russia, like b- building parallel systems, monetary, financial, technologically, infrastructurally, that this could alleviate, you know, this this suffering. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I hope that's the case. So, for example, Africa is the biggest uh, consumer of Chinese infrastructure skills outside of China. There's infrastructure projects all over the world. You see, uh, the Chinese come with a different form of development. The World Bank loans money to countries, and then they must find the contractors to build it. Now, from a construction point of view, that's a very bad way of doing it. Why? If I loan money and you build something, I take the risk. Okay, what do we do in the construction, in this German construction? We say to you, if you're going to build something, you bring your own loan. I pay you afterwards. You carry the risk. If that is all, we split it. If you can't do it because some projects, we split it between builder and constructor. If that happens, what happens? Compliance. Your bank's going to say, can you do it? Are you a good man? You know, what is your record, etc. They ask all those questions. Give me a plan, etc., etc. So what do the Chinese do? They say, we come with the wallet. We will build you a highway and you pay us when that highway opens up at a certain tariff. And that tariff will only pay for the highway. That's the same model that America had during the New Deal. That's the same model Europe had during the Marshall Plan. It's not a new model. It's not a Belt and Road. It's not something that is, uh, you know, out of this world type of the imperialism. It is just a model of development, good old developmental economics. And the Chinese have figured it out. It, it works to the favor of us in Africa because we don't have lots of money. We, we don't have um, pension fund money to gamble away on infrastructure that will go boom and bust on uh, because people skip money off the thing. So it is a win-win situation for everyone. And that is my view, the model that America must get intact with if it wants to compete against the world. The World Bank model does not work, the IMF model, because money goes missing. So that is one way to do it. The other way Iranians can do it is they can use their own money because they have some savings actually, um, and they can use that to rebuild their infrastructure. Um, but either way, somebody's going to pay for this stuff. And infrastructure will have to be rebuilt. Otherwise, we're going to sit with problems that our cities will collapse. Yeah. So sooner or later, the populations will wake up. Mm-hmm. Now, you've mentioned World Bank and IMF. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I didn't know all, all of this about how exploitative exploitative and and what are what a systemic thefts uh you know uh the imf and world bank and the, you know the central banking structure has 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 perpetrated in africa and so many other you know developing countries it's 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 a it's a it's a mind-boggling and i mean i, it's, I, it's, just, I just want to agree it's, it's not everywhere sometimes they have good projects okay? well uh, but, you but, just i just want to refer to uh, alex gladstein uh from the human mm-hmm. rights foundation he wrote like brilliant articles and books by now and uh I, there's some facts. I mean, uh, hardly anybody knew that, about that. It just, it just, I think, came to the surface yeah. now in the last few years. 
but um but this is why you know we are as a community such huge advocates of bitcoin because it will just obsolete everything else it just a new yeah, but but how are you going to fund large scale infrastructure on bitcoin i i i i'm not convinced of that bitcoin to me is still i i, I i've tried to figure it out but I, you need massive amounts of capital expenditure you know how are we going to get a loan and things of that sort if, if on the Bitcoin no, community? This is solvable. I don't think that's that's a huge challenge, to be honest with you. I mean, the thing is, we, we're uh, finally this, you know, uh, it's not going to be, you know, you talked about crony capitalism. Uh, I mean, it's systemic theft that's been going on for at least 100 years uh, through the central banking structures. And uh, governments, of course, uh, intertwined and uh, but but like creating debt out of nothing and uh, uh you know, playing with with interest rates and uh, and and you know and the whole yeah. No, I, I, I agree with you. These these banks and, and and the way they've been stealing money from the taxpayer. That's the accusation against them. It is there. Um, can you? My question still is: Can you deliver uh, the necessary investment for a population to rebuild, say, the interstate highway in America? It's a massive infrastructure project on anything else than government money. That means we have to pay taxes for it. Can you really do that on Bitcoin? I uh, I would like to believe that is true, but I don't know if if somebody's going to fund it. And th this is a problem that I think uh, the libertarians who tend to be Bitcoin people generally run into, is that they look into short-term profits, which is 10, 15, maybe 20 years. And on that basis, maybe Bitcoin can pay for some things. But whether or not it can run from 60 years type of infrastructure, which, I mean, take the Golden Gate Bridge in, bridge in the United States. It was built in San Francisco, one of the largest bridges in the world. It was built in 1932. The debt on that bridge was only paid off in the 1970s. Yeah, because I mean, yeah, because because 1913, you know, the Federal Reserve was created, and then uh, of course, 1971 was the official, you know, the Nixon shock uh, going off the gold sand. But actually, going off the gold sand began began actually shortly before the first World War, um, to a, to a, to a substantial degree. So. Uh, I think just going off this gold standard or leaving the gold standard and then, you know, uh, not having, you know, any backing or redeemability is, but okay, you know, it's, it's a whole, I think, discussion by itself, but it, it's, it will definitely change the, 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 the time preference, you know, because uh, mm. Bitcoin has never been done in history, uh, you know, in the history of mankind. Look, if Bitcoin can do that, if you can take a, a community of Bitcoiners, something inconceivable can say, we're going to give a loan, like an options, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you, you buy into options and that goes to a contractor and that's the infrastructure or a contractor is a Bitcoiner, but you need to make sure where the risk is being placed. That's all I'm saying. Um, if somebody builds something for you, he must take the Bitcoin loan. Okay. And the problem is when it comes to these large capital expenditure stuff, even if I take the loan, let's face it, if a project goes bust, um, I don't have the money to pay you back. So usually the government covers that risk. You understand? Yeah, but but there won't be any like you know like high high risk you know like sort of you know uh, uh, socialized losses system anymore. You know, I mean th this whole system is so criminal. I mean the criminality has actually been legalized. I mean through every layer and segment you can you can you you would analyze it. It's 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 it's, it's mind boggling. And I don't see a problem with Bitcoin even in a Bitcoin on a Bitcoin standard a hyper Bitcoinization system. You know. Uh, actually, uh, things going to improve dramatically. We're going to have abundance. We're going to uh, lower the time preference. That means people, for the first time, you know, will more rational, logically, you know, build stuff, invest. And uh, why wouldn't you know? Why would uh, uh, you know giving credit or or, or giving out loans? It, it's not going to abolish. You know, it's not going to abolish the, the loan system. It's just going to be more rational, more ethical, and more logical, and and widen the horizon, and meaning the lowering the time for offense. So it's not like like about short time, short term. Uh, you know, as you said, short term profitability. Uh, yeah. So th those are the problems. Maybe I would encourage the people in the Bitcoin community to think of is. Mm -hmm. You know, to prove my skepticism wrong. You know, I'm not. I'm not. You know, saying this in absolutism, but to say to them, if you want to fund to rebuild the Golden Gate Bridge, for example, which has to be rebuilt sometime in the future, or the Hoover Dam, or any of these things, how are you going to fund it with Bitcoin? How can you have a community owned, property owned? Is it government owned? You know, how does that work? And if you can solve those problems, I think more people would be convinced of it. You know, thus far, I, you know, construction companies. 
still we still get loans from governments okay this is no secret and we go and build infrastructure usually for other governments so it's government to government transactions the advantage of that is we lock out the middleman right okay because uh, the, 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 if the banks ask me for the money, they want to make sure that deal is properly structured. Okay, If you get the money to come to me, there's always guys that saying, how do I get into this deal? And that's where the Davos guys, that's by the way, the Davos, Davos guys hate nuclear power because nuclear contracts are set up in such a way that you cannot get into the deal. Mm-hmm. It's set up with, uh, except in the United States. Mm-hmm. That's why the US is so expensive. But the nuclear power, the international law protocols come into play. And these law protocols say, you will it's utilities to utilities there's no money to steal basically so that's why it's so open to 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 propaganda all the time because everyone attacks the nuclear industry for being dirty and dangerous and all the stuff we've heard which is complete nonsense and the simple reason is there's no constituency for nuclear there's no middleman there's no guy in the newspapers that's going to say buy nuclear sell nuclear it's people like me who work in the industry i used to even i'm not in the nuclear anymore who, who just love the technology explain to the public and what's ironically is that because only people are explaining it we're winning the argument i mean I, I don't know if you know this in twitter and with oliver stone's recent yeah. movie things have been changing a little bit and the other guys are getting hot under the collar because the public is working up to this oh i see mm-hmm. and, and they've now figured out that if you want to lock the guys out of davos from out of any deal because we know they're stealing money you're going to build nuclear power stations exactly okay. Yeah. So that's that's a good option. So if you can figure out Bitcoin of nuclear, given look at the deals of nuclear, look at how it's structured, and if you can make that work with the Bitcoin community, you can maybe start and saying we can have a nuclear power station for the Bitcoin community, just through the mines and the things, and that's going to pay for it. And maybe you know with that you can find a performant asset. If you can solve that problem, it will be incredible. I mean, I, yeah. I, I give that to the, the geniuses in Bitcoin at the moment. I don't know. Yeah, but you know. Uh, uh... Hugo, I mean, you know, the holistic perspective um, I and a lot of, you know, more, much more intelligent people have, like Jeff Booth, I would definitely, you know, urge you to read this, uh, why, why deflation is the key to an abundant future by Jeff Booth. And uh, it's called The Price of Tomorrow, Why Deflation is the Key to an Abundant Future. You know, as you know, technology is deflationary or should, or is, is if we just let it just, you know, let it run, it would just lower prices and we would have more comfort more you know <laughs> uh, more abundance in society and and that's what bitcoin is with the it's the scarcest money it has all the you know i mean dream like uh, properties mm-hmm. you can think of and it would just uh, create a system where we finally have the civilization we could have had you know 100 years ago you know we, we talked about this like last time well, well I, I like the fact that it creates trust between people mm-hmm. Okay, trust and compliance. And as I said, this is the, the nuclear contracts works the same. It forces trust and compliance. So from that basis, I'm completely in in, uh, in favor of the blockchain protocol. Because somebody gives me Bitcoin and I'm getting Bitcoin, I'm not getting cash that's going to inflate, right? That's the, the argument of it. So I, I like that way. I, I like the thinking, uh, uh, you know, in those applications. I mean, that blockchain protocol of uh, consensus and, and how it works and for cross verification, that's very good for other transactions in other day life as well. So I think if we can base our thinking on that, it will be a very good world because it will lock out criminality, which is what we actually care about. We don't want guys stealing money. We don't guys, guys nobody likes being cheated, things of that sort. So yeah, that's that's what I, I expect from them. As I just say, I'm still hesitant to throw my weight around it for anything that is large scale infrastructure. Um, and I, I would send out this challenge to the Bitcoin community to say, prove me wrong. You know, I, I would change my mind if I see the evidence. Right. Right. No, I get you. Uh, it just, um, you know, I think I'm trying always, you know, to talk about like the, the, the holistic picture, like how many technologies, like super innovative, advanced technologies have been suppressed, uh, confiscated in the name, name of national security or not developed, uh, you know, because of all these bad, really bad incentives or, you know, uh, c- controlling structures. So this is what I see, you know, uh, in co- always in connection with Bitcoin is that finally, whether we're talking about transportation, energy, healing, medicine, um, you know, I mean, uh, you know, the evo- evolution, advancement of humanity. The, finally, we will have will have these opportunities, you know, to bring out the technologies and and screw the patent system mm-hmm. because I think it's one of the you know most uh, criminal uh, you know thefts. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I don't see why people. Uh, it's, it's never made sense to me because. How did America develop? It's still the railway from Europe. Okay, so that's that is what copyright infringement. 
How is China developing today? We know they're copying technology, but that's what everyone is doing. The Chinese yeah, are not but like... Look at the trains. Look at the super yeah. high, high speed trains. I mean, we don't have that in Austria or in Europe yeah. or anywhere. Where are they? Where's the maglev trains? You know, I mean, Japan has it. So something has gone wrong, you know, uh, in, in our, in our, you know, in, in this. Well, the, 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 the thing you must take into account, our infrastructure is older in Europe. Mm -hmm. It's more expensive to rebuild stuff than it is. You need to sometimes upgrade them first. It's still not at the end of its lifetime. If you build a train, you build it for 50, 60 years. So, you know, don't, don't underestimate the intelligence or the capability of the engineers in Europe. They can do it. But it will take time to slowly upgrade it. Because remember, if we throw all our money into new railways, that's money taken from other places of the economy, you know, into it. I mean, as somebody in infrastructure, I like it if somebody tells me build a high-speed railway. But there's a realism that has to come to say our economy works the way it does. Our societies evolve this way with patterns of development in Europe going back thousands of years almost. And you cannot just change it overnight. So if these trains come to the end of their life, which some in France are now coming, slowly they will be upgraded to newer models. But you will need to upgrade the railway, you need to upgrade everything. And sometimes it's best to go with a solution that's maybe not the fastest, but the most optimal. You know. Uh, yeah, I get you. But but you understand. You understand? So it's 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 not that simple. The Chinese are lucky no, because they go from nothing. Yeah, Hugo, you know, there's not a lack of intelligence or, or engineers or ingenuity or innovators or, or inventors or whatever. And like, gee, we have, we have brilliant minds. It's just the system. Would it be the patent system, the central bank system, the military industrial complex, the, the monetary financial corporate complex? They don't want it. I mean, there's, there's no incentive. Why, why would they want it? I mean, it's about, it's, this is about control. Yeah, so but I, but those are the, the controls you need to fight. And one way to fight it is to mobilize, um, to mobilize people mm -hmm. to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we're doing it over here. It's because eventually they will be forced to listen to the electorates. They can only, I mean, look at COVID. Most people went along in the beginning. Eventually people started talking and they pushed back against the narrative. And it was actually a worldwide revolution against totalitarian control. Today, nobody talks about it anymore. The rules are pushed back, you know. There's still some remnant of it, but if you fly today, they don't ask for a ticket anymore. People have forgotten about it. The same is true of the Ukraine war. It was impossible to say negotiate with Russia. Now everyone is saying it. So the more people push back against the, the doctrine and the ideologies of the elites, the better the society becomes. The best you bring, the, you bring your government, you bring these institutions under democratic rule. And you can't even get rid of them. If you don't like a central bank, there's no world rule in the world that says we shouldn't have them. We can abolish it. And I said, the most, the more people talk and discuss the probability, the higher the probability will go into policy. And this is what they used to call traditional class struggle, is that ordinary people always feel that these rulers of them don't speak to them. And remember, they're just ordinary people in these organizations. You know, we talk about a deep state and a CIA and this, and that's fine, but they're just normal people. And they have to eventually listen to people talking. So the way to push back is to talk against this way and come up with solutions. You say Bitcoin has solutions for honest transactions. So use that for some of your transactions, you know. Now, Hugo, what, what do you see? I mean, to wrap this up a little bit, what do you see in the foreseeable future in the next 10, 20 years? I mean, do we have a chance to like uh, radically transform the, 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 the structures we have in um well, I'm always skeptical of people who want to radically change the world. I would just slowly change it. I think, yes, I, I, I think I'm more optimistic. I think there's far more people awake today about how deeply indoctrinated and brainwashed the media is and the politicians are. And I cannot see how this system, you know, this Davos ideology nonsense can last very long. I, I cannot I cannot see we seeing signs of it. I mean, look at today Sweden said uh, Greta Thunberg's theory ideology is gone. We um, you know th things of that sort. You see Estonia lost the government last year, for example. You see um, France. Macron was elected as anti-nuclear and pro Margaret Thatcher. That's how he was elected. Mm -hmm. Today he's renationalizing EDF, and they are, and they are recommitting to nuclear power. Because the French because, elected it. because the because people are I think they are tending more towards the sort of they call it I think right wing or whatever uh, is that the reason or no uh, what happened in France was the um, so so the goal understood France very well he understood the French Revolution started when people like you and me talked about our problems and he placed his strategic national assets all over France all the nuclear power stations 
So when Macron wanted to talk to him, he realized they didn't know what was happening. All these people started mobbing, the ouvriers, the workers, and they formed groups like La Voix du Nucléaire to educate the public and each other on nuclear power. And what eventually happened is they forced the elites to listen to us, which was the lesson of the French Revolution. The French Revolution occurred because the elites were too far detached from the ordinary people. And the collective common knowledge of ordinary people is much more stronger than somebody who studied at the Grand Ecole. That was the that was the lesson, to the point now that the political pressure is so strong, on in any political party in France, left or right, doesn't matter, they have to recommit to the traditional trajectory of France, which was nuclear power, and that is what the French understood. It's not about your politician being left or right wing or you vote, it's about making it too expensive for any one of them to go against your wishes. And that is how the French has done. And that's why I think France is a very good country to watch for this, because they're breaking away from this type of thinking. They're going back to traditional thinking, which the Chinese have been doing. So I'm optimistic. Uh, I'm optimistic by the changes I'm seeing. I'm not st I don't think we are there yet. I think we're still far away. But I think a lot of these guys in Davos are very scared of what's happening, because they know they cannot stop the people anymore. They can only try and hide and they can fly from private chain to the next IPCC conference and pretend in front of the media how love they care the planet and, you know, all these uh, superficial, superficial nonsense. People are seeing through it. And I, it, it makes me excited that so many people have waked up. I mean, we could have a fundamental discussion. I mean, one day maybe we could have a fundamental, even with Matthew Herod, like, what do you think about like nations? I mean, isn't it time for human species to evolve? I mean, do we really need the nation state? Do we need the government? Do we need? Um... Sure, but I, I, I still believe that um, human nature is what it is. Mm -hmm. And I believe there will always be a nation state. I, I think nationalism and, and you know, nationalism is a good thing in some places. Austria has a very good nationalism because of its military service. It's not a negative nationalism. Mm -hmm. The Austrians are, I've met are very proud of their country and they, you know, they, they like serving there you know they're not excessive about nationalism mm -hmm. um and the swiss have a very good system where they all serve a common cause military since the time of napoleon the swiss love their country switzerland's one of the most highly performing countries in the world scandinavian countries as well so i, I think people need to not be you, you see people are very negative against the institutions and i think that's part of the propaganda I think people need to understand their country. They need to understand how it worked historically. And then they need to force those institutions to change. And they can change. Because there's, there's this story going around, it will never change. It is always against us. It's always uh, too much money in the system, etc. I don't believe that for a minute. I believe that if you put enough pressure on your populations and you mobilize, you can bring systemic changes over long periods of time. Yeah, that but that would require who go starting with kindergarten, school system, educational system. And it it's, is part, it's part of it. It's part of it. System. I mean, just look at the children. I mean, I, we, we will not send our daughter to school. We, I'm gonna, we're going to homeschool her. I'm going to bring the best geniuses' minds over here. And, you know, I mean, you have to have the time and resources. I mean, I'm aware of that. But, um, but you know, it starts everywhere. I mean, it's like the media. It's, it's, but but, but the, the, there is a small change that you can make in your life. Mm -hmm. to 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 uh, which we can potentially have ripple effects down the way. We think I think of something similar at this moment in time. I'm speaking to unions back home in South Africa, educating them on nuclear power. People who work in coal mines to understand that there's a way out of this thing if the carbon issue is really an issue. Okay, that you can play an important role in your own society. You know, you educating people about Bitcoin. It's an important thing, and all these conversations collectively will have a rippling effect on the popular on on the politicians. And it will force a systemic change. So, you know, what we're doing is very good. And I, I think we must just continue to make the contribution you can with the limited time you have, because you also have to work and you also have a family. And, you know, we, we, all, we all like that. Most people are not uh, going to be the top leader changing the world. And I'm skeptical of those people. But if you do it in that fashion, I think systemic changes will come. You know, and before you look 10, 20 years when you're retired and your daughter, she might live in a much better world than you live in at the moment. Mm -hmm. and that's actually what people want at the end of the day, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, we have to go back to the roots and more to regional, local projects. Um, you know, I'm a huge fan also of this project, Free Private Cities. It's called, I don't know what it's called right now. It's maybe it's a different, a different name, but sort of it's a private contractor as a service provider <laughs> and you live whatever that is in Honduras or I don't know, it's like a, like a, like a, island for itself uh, yeah. or, you know where you know technologies come companies come investors come and they build their own regional local project and 
and you sign up, you know, if you don't want it, you don't want it, you know, but it's a sort of a service provider, right? You, you, you pay your whatever fees per year and uh, you get the services and you get, you know, the technologies and the infrastructure and everything else. So maybe this is the way to evolve, uh, you know, locally. Yeah, that's, that's about, you know, it's what Patrick Wood told me is, uh, it was a year or two ago, I spoke to him. He said, you know, think global, but act local. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to do. Make the changes you can in your own life. Don't try and change the World Bank. <laughs> it's it's not going to happen. But change, you will live in Austria. Change the, try and be a change, you, you know, in your own society. And if people make those small sacrifices, which can actually be pleasurable, you know, it's actually nice to, to be involved in communities and things. If you can make those small sacrifices in your own lives, you know, I've learned a lot from you about Bitcoin. I don't know stuff, for example. You know, I'm sure you learned from me about nuclear power. Mm -hmm. We learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And it's ultimately that collective knowledge. Because let's say this topic of Bitcoin pops up in my own life in the future. I'm going to phone you and say, can you please explain to me what's going on here and here? And you have the answer. Mm -hmm. And you make these connections. And that's how we share and learn from each other. Right. Um, that was a fast, fantastic conversation. So uh, to wrap this up with Iran, uh, is there like a message you would want to give like to the Iranian population or the, especially to the younger people? Well, I, I would say don't give up hope and don't believe that nothing can change the society. Because I, I don't believe, I, mean, I think the Iranian youth are enormously talented people. Okay, they are very intelligent people and they have deep conversations and they understand the problems in their own society. But what they need to do is start speaking to each other and start negotiating and move away from the dogma and the struggles that your parents had. The problems that your parents overcame is not yours anymore. Okay. And find your own, you know, your own challenges. Every generation has its own challenges. Okay. So my view to Iranians is to simply that, to find the solution for the problems in your own country, in your own society. And those problems, the answer is not always in politics. Sometimes it is community, sometimes it's... I mean, my wife has a friend, for example. She teaches women. She's a woman entrepreneur in Iran. Very rare thing to have, okay? And she teaches women self-confidence and things of that sort. Every week, she is uh, teaching the deaf people of Iran in Tehran. To read it right. You know, so you have things of that sort. Those are people that make the change in the country. And I would say to the Iranians, you need to listen to those people you know, over a long period of time. Wow, beautifully said. No words of wisdom. Um, anything coming up? Are you are you writing on an article, another article? I'm, I'm uh, writing a lot on Substack. I'm doing a lot on nuclear power because South Africa is doing major overall to our political changes. And um, uh, I would like serious discussion in South Africa about nuclear power and the world for that matter. I think the future of energy is nuclear power. I'm convinced of that. The technology we have today might not be the most optimal in terms of nuclear because its full thermodynamic potential has not been exploited. And I think a lot of brains need to look into that and say, how can we bring the cost down? How can we make the things work? How can we make them more performant? All of those things. I think we need to rebuild the traditional ones first to know what we've lost. And then from there, we use that as a basis to make the most more advanced reactors. And it's time we stand up to the environmental lobbyists and the people who say it's not, it's not safe, it's not dangerous. Learn your arguments, educate yourself on the technologies. Because my view is what I see in the industry at the moment, that is the future. Mm -hmm. All the intelligent kids are going back into nuclear. And I, I think they, you know, you should usually follow where your brains are in society. So yeah, that's the lesson that I'm, I'm sort of leaving. Yeah, education. Yeah, it always comes back, uh, you know, to education mm -hmm. and being informed and comprehension, like really holistic comprehension, and connecting the dots. I think this is what's always been important to me, like understanding first the bigger picture and going into details. Uh, so Hugo, thank you so much. Uh, I can. I'm gonna link your. Uh, I'm gonna add your Twitter handle and your Substack, and any other info you wanna have. No, I think that's all. Thanks for this great conversation. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Man. Yeah, and we'll repeat that hopefully in the very near future with Matthew Arad and or maybe Cynthia Chang. I think it will be a very fruitful discussion. I think it's going to be very fascinating to connect the dots together with you, uh, with all your knowledge and wisdom. All right. Thank you very much. Kevin. All right, Hugo. Have a wonderful Cheers. Sunday, okay? Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.